There's a sound of worship in this house that has to be brought forth this morning. And let us lift it up now. away from being extinct and the same birthplace of the church has now become a tourist attraction and so we have a lot of work to do in our generation and this is the generation that will be different from a previous we pulled ourselves up with our boot strings and we navigated terrain uh, based on the Holy Spirit without fathers and mothers to birth us out but we are the generation that will become fathers and mothers to birth out a new generation. And you have a tough job ahead of you, but we know that you have a group of individuals that are around you that will help to chart the course and to build the strategy for sustainability. And I, 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 I don't envy you one bit. Um, it's going to be tough, but God has the grace for you and we need you to succeed. We need that. We need it in our community. We need it amongst our own. And so I'm going to do everything I possibly can to pray you through. If I can't do anything, I can pray. And I know how to de deal with demons in the realm of the spirit. So I'm gonna be praying. I have a group of prayer warriors that pray with me and we're gonna be praying for you. And then all the Bishop Council and uh, the College of Bishops and the Tears of Leadership and those of you that are gathering together, we greet you in Jesus' name. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the time allotted that you would give me the ability of articulation, that you would take these concepts and that you would put it in the correct context and then give me the ability to navigate the spiritual terrain so that we will walk away with principles that we can apply to fulfill your original plan and purpose. Think through my mind, speak through my lips, let there be none of me and all of you. We thank you for the anointing that is commensurate with this assignment. We thank you for the fresh word. It's not by our might nor by our power, but it's by the spirit. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your presence and we thank you, Father. Father, for what you will do and for how you will confirm your words with signs and wonders. Break the spirit of indifference. Take us to the next level. Let us walk away and leave the old so that we can walk in the new. Bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hug the person on your left and right and just announce to them, this is the last time you're going to see me in this state. I'm never going to be in this place ever again. I'm never going to be here spiritually. I'm never going to be here financially. I'm never going to be here intellectually. I'm not going to be here socially. I'm never going to be in this spot, this place, another day in my life. Tonight is your going away party. We're going to, uh, we're going to forget those things which are behind. And we're going to lunge out in the deep. And tonight is the night. The spot that you're standing marks the ending of your history and the beginning of your destiny and your best days this is not just a colloquial expression this is a truism your best days lie ahead of you and I tell you this is the worst your life will ever be this is the worst your finances will ever be this is the worst you will ever feel your best days stretch ahead of you you have nothing to look back to and to look back uh, uh, for you have everything that lies ahead of you everything to look forward to and I'm decreeing and declaring that you will hear the word of the Lord and that you would use these principles to do something great in your generation you may have your seat you're gonna have three opportunities or four opportunities uh, before the night is out opportunity number one you're gonna have the opportunity to pick up a copy of this tape and you're going to want to pick up the copy of this tape. I'm going to be speaking very, very fast because we have a lot of territory to cover. And um, I've already spent some time and my time starts ticking when I read the scripture. And um, uh, we already um, have 
uh, the opportunity to um, uh, speak to you, but I'm going to be speaking so quickly. I want to download as many concepts as I possibly can. I, wanted to, I want to put it in a context. A concept without a context brings you into the realm of frustration because you will, will not have the ability to properly apply. And where there's no application, there could be no manifestation. And so we've just wasted our time. So we want to place it in the proper context. And if your context is wrong, when you receive a concept, your conclusion will be wrong. I'm gonna say it again, if your context is wrong, when you receive a concept, then your conclusion is wrong. So that means that no amount of me preaching is gonna make a difference in your life if your context is wrong. Are you with me? So I have the opportunity now to do a Jabez, enlarge my territory, just, just increase my ability to receive the downloads. It's an enlargement and it's ex an ex expansion. And I've asked God uh, and, and prepared for this very hard. And I've asked God for a special anointing because I'm coming behind some great preachers. And uh, I can't say more than what these preachers have said. I can only offer you my perspective on a partic particular topic. And so it's not, uh, I'm, you're not gonna hear anything new you're just gonna hear a new perspective, amen? And so I'm going to weigh in on a subject. That's what I'm going to do, weigh in on a subject. But it's gonna to come to you uh, like a drive-by shooting. So it's gonna be quick. We're gonna come in, we're gonna spray, and we're gonna drive out. And you're going to want to get a copy of the tape. I'm gonna tell you why. What, what I'm downloading, I was invited by an executive from Coca-Cola. And I was invited also by a country. And I introduced the concept and the president of that country uh, arranged a meeting and we sat and we began to talk about how to turn around a country and what's going on in the world. And I was just shooting um, and saying, okay, this is what's going on. Here are the shifts that have happened and this is the role that you need to play. Here are the emerging markets. And he said to me, he said, if you give me that information, if you give it to me, I'll give you citizenship in my country. And I was tempted and I said, I will sell it to you. And I, I really meant it. I would sell it to you and then I would spend some time as your consultant to share with you how you can turn your nation around. And so we're in no negotiations. And I'm going to sell it for a few million dollars. What you're carrying is very expensive. And most people cannot afford to sit in your presence. But because you've learned how to devalue yourself and dumb down to fit in and blend in, you become a part of the problem and not a part of the solution. And, and so I'm gonna talk very fast but what you're getting is a few million dollars given to you and you're going to want to go to the back and you're going to want to pay whatever it costs for that tape. I don't know if it's $15. If it was me, it would be a, probably $150,000 for this one tape, if it was me, but it's not me. So $15, $150,000, get the tape and stop nickel and diming yourself. And I want you to listen to it over and over and I want you to take a pen and piece of paper and take your notes and pray through the revelation. The points are gonna be fast. The second half, I'm doing a PowerPoint. The first half, I'm gonna load it into. It's all over the world that you would release your spirit in such a way that every yoke would be broken and destroyed. Father, our prayer here tonight so for the next few moments that we have together, I really want to share with you what God has put in my heart, and I'm going to talk to you about this whole concept of how do we begin to shift our brilliance. But as I was praying, I said, Lord, why is it that you want full gospel Baptist church to shift? And what God began to download to me is because he's shifting you to release you into another dimension. 
When you study string theory, there are eight to 10 levels in one dimension. So when we begin to understand that God is shifting us to release us, there is a dimensional anointing that he is releasing in the house. Uh, many of you, when you return back to your churches and to your communities, they will never be the same again because you will never be the same again. Because when you begin to understand what God has put in your heart, when it is time to shift and go to another dimension, you will become uncomfortable being comfortable. And when you become uncomfortable being comfortable, you will begin to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, going to the refrigerator, open the refrigerator, closing it back, not taking anything out because you weren't hungry in your belly. There was a hole in your soul saying that there was another dimension that was possible. When you begin to understand the dimension of God, one of the things you begin to realize is that sometimes God will give you a 50 by 60 dream, but you have to realize at times you have people that have 8 by 10 thinking around you. And when you are moving into that another dimension, everybody around you, they cannot speak the language of that dimension. When you begin to understand that, you say, God, what is the brilliance? What is that thing that you have put in me? Because it will not leave you alone. Some of you over the last 30, 60, 90 days have not been able to sleep at all because you've been feeling a tap on your shoulder. You've had to get up and begin to pray in the spirit and walk around because you're giving birth to another dimension. And when you're giving birth to another dimension, those who have been around you don't quite get you because they're not supposed to get you because they don't understand where you're going. My God, you can never take a person to a place you have never been yourself. So in the last 30 to 60, 90 days, God has been trying to work something out in you. You can't even give speech to it. You can't even language it. But you know that something is getting ready to shift up in here, up in here. When you are getting ready to shift, one of the things you begin to say, I, 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 hear, I hear greatness. I, I, I hear destiny. I hear power. Thank you, Doc, uh, Sister Tasha Cobbs, for letting us know that when we begin to hear in a new dimension, a message is sent to the central nervous system that has to begin to reorient itself on what we begin to see and feel on the inside. So everything that I'm about to share with you in the next few moments can be encapsulated in this idea. The stream that you drink from is the stream that you think from, and eventually it's the stream that you become. I'm going to say that again. The stream that I drink from, the table where my spirit is fed, that is the stream that I think from, and eventually it's the stream that I become. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So we are now, ladies and gentlemen, living in what I will call the age of brilliance. And the age of brilliance is the culture, is a culture of invention that is generated by the individual imagination. Uh, as we begin to look globally, there is a shift that has taken place in what many will call the BRIC nations or the BRICs. Uh, BRICS is an acronym that stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Within the last day, uh, last 10 years, Brazil has moved two to 300 million people above the poverty level. The real, which is their currency, has leveled out. Brazil is rich with natural resources. So instead of looking all over the world for somebody to hook them up, they have begun to discover that everything we need is right here in our land. Yes, yes, yeah. Russia has invested billions of dollars in science and technology. Indonesia, one of the most interesting countries, uh, only about 200 million people that live in Indonesia, but they have some of the most amazing technology. Uh, China, if you are a student of history, back in the 15th to 18th century, China was a superpower. Within the last decade, China has moved 300 million people above the poverty level, and China wants to buy up America, if you have not noticed. 
South Africa, and specifically when you look at South Africa, a lot of great things on the whole continent of South Africa. But what's interesting, there's a book that I want you to get a hold of. It's a book called Africa Rising, Africa Rising, written by a professor from the University of Texas who has been studying Africa for a number of years. And there are 500 million people on the continent of Africa, and a significant part of the population is under the age of 24. So the next great consumerism and consumers in the world is coming from the most amazing continent on the planet. Most recently, there is a lot of talk globally about the MIT nations. MIT nation stands for Mexico, uh, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. Uh, what's interesting about the MIT nations, and specifically Nigeria, Nigeria has created their own Hollywood, uh, where they do their own thing, and now they are making significant noise around the world because of the oil that they have. One of the interesting things, when I looked at all of this, when you look at each of these nations globally, there was something that happened in their mind where they begin to shift in their thinking, and they begin to, if I would take the word shift, I would say it's see how I fit tomorrow. Shift. See how, everybody say it, say see how I fit tomorrow. Shift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so when we begin to understand that and we look at the last 108 years here in the economy, we have discovered that people have moved from earning a wage with their hands to now earning it with their mind. When we look specifically at shifts in the world, we have to look at the education system. We know that many years people are told to go to school, get a degree, and there will be a job waiting on you. That is no longer the case because you have a lot of people that went to school and there was no job waiting for them. What's interesting about the shift in the education system is right now there's this whole thing called MOOCs. Have you heard of the acronym MOOCs at all? Uh, MOOC stands for Massive Open Enrollment Courses. So I'll give you an example. About a year ago, I wanted to take a course to understand this whole term called gamification. Gamification is something that all of you are familiar with. If you have a credit card, as, 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 as uh, Mother Morton said, uh, if you have a credit card and you get points on that card, they will send you something to gain your loyalty. That's called gamification. And it was taught by a professor out of uh, University of Pennsylvania Wharton School. And guess how many people were signed up for the class? 62,000 people signed up for the class globally, and guess how much the class cost? Zero, nothing. Because what's happening in education, what they're doing is the Ivy League schools and many schools are saying, how do we begin to bring our best professors and teach people what we have taught for years, thus opening it up into the entire world to begin to learn on a whole nother dimension? It's all over the world that you would release your spirit in such a way that every yoke would be broken and destroyed. F Hallelujah. I want you to grab your Bible uh, and uh, I want you to meet me in the book of Genesis. I want you to meet me in the book of Genesis. And if you don't mind, I don't know what the protocol of the house is, but uh, if you don't mind, I'll ask you to stand one more time as we reverence the word of the Lord. Uh, I just believe that God's word is holy and uh, demands that we reverence it in every way that we possibly can. Uh, I want to impart some things uh, that uh, I really feel led of the Lord to share uh, for this house in this season and in this time. Revelations, actually, you know what? Let's not go to Revelations. Thank you, Lord. I, I may get there, but let's start in Genesis. Let's go to Genesis 13. Genesis 13 and verse number 14. Let's start there. Thank you, Lord. Genesis 13 and verse 14. I don't know what the uh, translation of the house is. What I brought with me is the new international version of God's holy writ. In Genesis 13 and 14, it says, The Lord said to Abram after Lot had departed from him. The Lord said to Abram after. Somebody say after. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had departed from him, lift up your eyes from where you are 
and look north and south and east and west. All of the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and the breadth of the land for I am giving it to you. So Abram, Abraham moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron where he built an altar to the Lord. You may be seated. I want to take some time to share some principles from my best-selling book, The People Factor, and uh, I really want to uh, stand in this text and to maneuver through uh, the backdrop of this text with this thought in mind, don't let them kill you. Don't let them kill you. Uh, leadership, uh, organizational, business, managerial guru Peter Drucker has gone on record and said numerous times that the four most difficult jobs in America, uh, not in any particular order, but they are these things. It's the president of the United States, university president, hospital CEO, and pastor. And the common denominator that runs through all of those jobs is the struggle to deal with people. This is part of the reason why, for me, in my own personal journey, after uh, 20 years of leadership and working in the business community and even in ministry, what I have discovered is that for many individuals, their biggest struggle in life is not with God, but instead it's with people. As a matter of fact, the great German theologian Martin Luther once remarked, if it were not for Christians, there would actually be more Christians. <laughs> and I think many of us can evidence that, that our struggle is not with God. Our, our struggle is dealing with the people who claim to follow him. And this is not only the issue in ministry, but this is also the issue within the marketplace. The uh, Association for Psychological Type did a study recently, and what the study revealed as they looked at businesses and organizations uh, in the greater world is that they realized that 60 to 80 percent, this is what the study revealed, that 60 to 80 percent of all issues in the workplace have nothing to do with gifting, have nothing to do with talent, but have everything to do with relational issues. This means for all of us in the church and outside of the church, it means that you can be the most gifted the most talented, and even be the most anointed individual, but your inability to do relationships well will be your undoing. This demands then that every leader be ambidextrous. It, it means then that, that with one hand, every leader has got to preach and, and, and pursue and possess the promises of God, while with the other hand, they have to navigate through the minefield of relationships and do relationships well. In, in other words, you, you've got to have a firm grasp on both dimensions of the cross. See, I really, I really believe, I really believe that the body of Christ, that we, have, that we have mastered in many ways the vertical aspect of the cross. I think we get that. But what we don't do so well is the horizontal dimension or the horizontal aspect of the cross. I, I think we, we got it. I think we, we got the vertical dimension of the cross, that, that even in its lowest common denominator in terms of communicating what Jesus came to do, the heart of God, that he sent his son to reconcile a lost world back to God. That's, that's vertical. But what we don't really do so well is we don't do that horizontal stuff. We, we don't do that loving your neighbor uh, as you love yourself stuff. We, 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 don't, we don't do that. We do the vertical well. We can worship and we can, we can do church and we can, we can praise and, and we can have powerful prayer. But what we don't do well is how to live in the reality of being between two thieves. The horizontal is the problem. And when you only grasp one dimension of the cross, the cross then becomes a stick that you pick up and use to beat people with. 
And then the stakes get even higher when biblical truth like Proverbs 13 and 20 then enter into the picture. Because Proverbs 13 and 20 says that he who walks with the wise grows wise, but a counsel of fools suffers harm. And the truth of this scripture teaches us that all relationships, that, that all people in your life and even the ones that you will encounter will fit into one of two categories. Either they will be wise and will help your relationship and help your life, or they will be foolish and they will hinder you. Let me say it another way. They will either be armor bearers or pallbearers. Either they will help you slowly get to your destiny or they will slowly carry you to your grave. Do you hear what I'm trying to teach you? The right relationships will add value to your life and propel you and your organization to heights beyond your wildest dreams and greatest expectations. While the wrong relationships will keep you tethered to mediocrity and disappointment for the rest of your days. So when I tell you don't let them kill you, what I'm here to share with you is that the wrong relationships will kill your heart, will kill your vision, will kill your dreams, will kill your passion for leadership and change and even the things that God has called you to accomplish for his glory. I have seen some of the most gifted and talented individuals in the church and outside of the church who are bitter and burnt out and depressed and disillusioned and just disheartened totally because they failed to develop the right relationships with the right people the right ways. And so this is the lens through which I want you to look with me at a familiar story in the Word of God. I know that I'm standing here in front of some of the most gifted preachers and teachers. I know that there are amazing Bible scholars and, and leaders uh, in the body that are in this room. And so I know that you're familiar with the story of Abraham. I, I know that. I know that you're familiar with uh, the fact that Abraham is the father of the faith and in, in many words throughout scripture. But, but beyond that, I want to invite you to look at the story of Abraham because I think that if you look at it through this lens, his life teaches us valuable lessons about relationships relationships and the importance of pulling the right people around you. As a matter of fact, I submit to you, I submit to you that the most dangerous and emotionally taxing relationship in Abraham's life was not the relationship with Hagar. I know that the relationship with Hagar is kind of on the front page of our mind when we think about the life and the legacy of Abraham, but I want to submit to you that that was not the most damaging relationship. That was not the most disastrous and emotionally taxing relationship in his life. I want to submit to you that the more dangerous relationship in Abraham's life was not when he went half on a baby with Hagar, but instead it was his relationship with Lot. And when you look closely at that relationship between Abraham and Lot, it shows you the kinds of traits that you and I need to look for and even avoid as it relates to building an army, building our team, and pulling some of the right people versus the wrong people around us. Amen? Now, I know you're ready to receive, and I'm, I'm excited about being not only in this room, but at this particular conference, because this is the room for leaders. Amen. And so you didn't come here to hear the greatest hoop or hear the greatest sermon. You came here to get strategies uh, that you can take home to help impact your ministry, change your cities, and change your communities. Amen. So I want to give you, I want to give you some traits. I hope you got something to write with and something to write on because I want to give you really five things. There's so much that I could give you, but in my time, I only really want to give you about five things and we'll unpack more as you pick up the book. But, but I want to give you these five things that you need to be aware of to avoid allowing them to kill you. It's all over the world that you would release your spirit in such a way that every yoke would be broken and destroyed. Father, I share to impart. We pray, God, that uh, you might speak to us and we give your name glory and praise for what shall happen in this place. Take us deeper. Let us leave here with practical application. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. I want to uh, just begin telling you a story of evolution uh, uh, 
in my pastoral ministry. I want to set this up because I believe it's important as we talk about reset. You should have a handout uh, in your possession today. Uh, in 1992, uh, with the backpack on and blue jeans and tennis shoes, uh, I began pastoring the Mount Zion Baptist Church. Um, the humble beginnings of that church uh, when 70 people on a good Sunday would show up. Uh, a good offering would be about $1,200 a Sunday. As I talk to many pastors and leaders, what I'm discovering is I'm seeing it all around that there are a lot of people who are sacrificing their families on the altar of their ministry. And that's why it's important that you understand the tremendous burden that comes along with pastoral ministry. There is a burden that comes along, and that's why uh, young preachers, young, young ministers, make certain you marry right, because if you marry wrong, it's going to be hell to pay. Uh, you really have to understand that a person who you marry, who you engage with in ministry, they have to be anointed to walk alongside you to where God is taking you. And that's an incredible frustration. It's an elephant in the room. We don't like talking about it, but I need to talk about it because it's an elephant in the room. And there's really uh, a lot of things around uh, this because when you begin to think about it just for a moment, a lot of pitfalls in terms of marriage and pastoral ministry. And one is pastoral ministry can isolate you from your family. Uh, there are many of us today who really feel that you know, we're isolated from our family because of the work we have to do. We're moving and moving and moving and doing this. In, in Exodus chapter 18, it gives us this whole pathology of the family. And you begin to see how Moses was separated really from his own family, never there. For some pastors and leaders, you are never there. You're doing God's work. You're out there working for God, but you're not working with God. I am so impressed, and I think it's amazing. We have an incredible model how uh, our founder has done all that he has done and traveled the world and built a fellowship, and all his children are saved and got good sense. I mean, it's, it's just amazing to me. Uh, and, and it's important that model is something we should never take for granted because there are many of us who have forsaken our own families on the altar of our ministry. And so it's important that you recognize this because if not, your ministry, your marriage will be on the rocks here. Manifestation will never never take place in discord. Manifestation will never take place with hidden agendas. Manifestation will never take place where there is toxicity. We got to say, Lord, give us a place of worship yeah. where the power of God yeah. can heal. Yeah. That people can just come in and the power of God be so thick that people can get healed. People can just come in and manifestations take place. The power of God, the atmosphere. Wait a minute. Here it is. Here it is. The Bible says that immediately many gathered and the Bible says there was no room to receive them. Neither near the door, and he preached the word to them. Now that's important because if you really want the big people ask all the time, Bishop, how do you grow your church? What strategies? What are the strategies? I tell them, uh, just preach the word. I don't go to restaurants where there's not a wait. I like the wait because the wait tells me the food's good. It's all over the world that you would release your spirit in such a way that every yoke would be broken and destroyed. Father, I... But I greet you in the name that's above every name and who holds the position that's above every position. And his name is Jesus and his position. He's Lord of Lord and King of Kings. But I love him because he saved me. I got any saved people in the house? Amen. Got any saved people in the house? Let me get to my assignment because that lady has that timer. Now, let me, y'all got to know this, though, because uh, let you know how old I am. Brandon, Larry Brandon Jr. is here, but I knew Larry Brandon Sr., and we stood on the corner in Sabrina Park in East Oakland, and he was the one who introduced me to white port and lemon juice, his daddy. <laughs> Amen. Not him, his daddy. Amen. Uh, mm. That's how old I am. Say amen. Uh, uh, <laughs> but his daddy got saved before he went on to the Lord and really had an incredible witness, and I thank God for him. But he was a, he was a wise man, but he just, just drank white port and lemon juice. Uh, 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 uh. 
I ain't got no real folk in the house. I hope I do. Because where, where I'm going. Let me just go. My, my talk, let me kind of give you. Um, I, the lady preached the other night, uh, and she talked about uh, context, concept, and conclusion. I got that much from her message, but, but context, <laughs> concept, and conclusion. Say man. And my context, y'all. Say amen. <laughs> mm. Amen. Yeah. My context serves um, to help me shape some of the conclusions that I've strived at. Number one, um, the past the church where I'm now serving, the first pastor there was uh, Nathaniel Fennell, and I was a little boy there in that church, and it was highly, it was highly Pentecostal uh, at that time, and Fennell believed that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And then the next leader came along, Dr. H. Newman, some of you all know, uh, he sought to enhance the energy of the people's spirituality with what he called information. He said, you got to have information, not just inspiration, but also information. So he had a Romans 10 perspective of ministry about my people have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. I've tried to integrate what they both did, integrate inspiration and integration with transformation. Somebody say transformation. So I kind of got a Romans 12 perspective on ministry. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what I'm going to share with you all, uh, it's sort of this issue of story, this issue of story. Somebody say story. And it's, it's birthed out of that, and I believe that transformation is from the, from the inside out and not the outside in. And so I'm going to ask you all to do something tonight. I'm going to ask you all to do something today. It's something you all ain't used to doing either. And I want you to do it to the best of your ability. I'm going to pull out the, the mystic in you, and I'm going to ask you uh, to, as you listen to me, don't get so caught up on what I'm saying, but I want you uh, to listen to what your own spirit is saying. Are y'all with me? I ain't asking you to tune me out. Don't, don't get distracted. But, but I'm asking you to be present y'all, and sit with the issues that are raised as I present what I'm presenting. And so don't try to too much write the outline of what I'm saying, but listen to what your own voice is saying. And it's going to become clear as I go forward. Because a lot of time I think we, we equate external stimulation as eternal revelation. But Jesus said that the kingdom is within you, which suggests that perhaps internal illumination leads to, intern to eternal revelation. Are y'all with me? Where my slide lady? I was looking at you, Bishop. You was clicking with your phone, and I went to get the app. I said, I'm going to try that too. But I said, that's way too much for me. <laughs> Ain't no need of me trying to do all that. <laughs> Say, man, I, I'll be up here a technological fool. All right. It's all over the world that you would release your spirit in such a way that every yoke would be broken and destroyed. Father, I, I love it. I love it. It's just good to be here today. Have you been blessed? I am here to tell you that this has been, and, and, and what a way for me to close as the last... Uh, conference for me pastors and ministry workers conference as presiding bishop y'all saved the best for last <laughs> i'll tell you this has just been i mean my mind is blown everybody if you don't get all of these tapes this week something wrong with you 
I tell you, every speaker, thank you, Dr. Bernstein. You blessed us today. Such a unique style, a unique gift. We appreciate you so much. I just thank God for you and for uh, just allowing him to use you. So, And I tell you, you know who kicked us off today, our presiding bishop-elect. That was just crazy, crazy, crazy. This is, this is a God thing. When are we going to start believing the Bible? No weapon. No weapon that is formed against us shall prosper. Just lift your hands all over this place. Thank you, Lord, for this shift. God, if I would have missed you, somebody else could have missed you. Oh, but as I sat here, as I get on the calls, Lord, as I sat during the course this week, and hearing all of those minister, share that most. All God kept telling me is, I told you. I told you. It's in. Come on, praise him in this place. Come on, praise him in this place. Come on, praise him in this place. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, 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 oh, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. word for the day and I want you to take it with you. Shift, shift, shift. Shift, shift, shift. Oh, you better shift. Oh, you better shift. Oh, you better shift. Take your seat.